Hi, I'm Carlotta Waldman. Welcome back to NowFaith.tv second semester. I'm hoping that you were able to finish reading Transformation of the Inner Man and that you have a thorough, a good foundation now of healing and freedom where you can minister to others. We've used a few of the prayers from Biblical Healing and Deliverance by Chester and Betsy Kilstra and we'll be using more so be sure to have this book on hand. We're going to go further into healing men and women, but one book that we consider a must read is Healing Women's Emotions by Paula Sanford. Whether you're a man or woman in ministry, you won't get by without knowing how to minister and more effectively to women. And if you haven't read The Bait of Satan, please avoid the pitfalls that Satan would set in your trap by reading this book so that you will know, you will know how to avoid his bait when he tries to get you even just a little bit off track, you might think, just a little bit, but really to derail you from the destiny and calling that God has for you. This semester we're going deeper. I'm hoping that you've already prayed all the prayers from semester one. If you're just now joining, please treat yourself and go back and do it because the people you minister to forever and ever <laughs> will be grateful that you got the healing and freedom that you didn't even know you needed. Amen? <laughs> I imagine many of you are surprised from the testimonies you're sending me. You thought you were taking this course so that you could minister better to others, and you will, but we all found out with tears, <laughs> with tears, that we needed healing and freedom ourselves, but God is always faithful. Whatever He reveals, He takes care of. Amen? So I hope that you will do your homework. You'll send in your half-page testimony, letting me know what God is doing, because if we don't apply it first to ourselves and get the log out of our own eyes, what good are we? And that you're praying in agreement with someone else. If you haven't started your small group yet, ask God, who can I have in a small group? How can you minister through me? Because it's not about us, is it? It's about Him and His faithfulness. I'm hoping that you'll even consider inviting us to do a seminar. We've just held two training seminars, um, one for the staff of a ministry in the South, Cheerful Hearts, and you can see that whole seminar on NowFaith.tv under healing, under healing videos. We even have demonstrations and prophetic ministry and the vision that the leader got. We show you the setting where we stayed. It's almost like you went there, except you don't have to spend hundreds of dollars to do it on NowFaith.tv, right? Right. Praise God for technology. Also, if you invite us to hold a seminar where you are, we can expect that God will tailor these seminars that you see on the homepage at Crosswalk Life, tailor them to the needs of your ministry. would never give you a canned spiel. But today, let's get on with what God is doing now, teaching us how to minister more effectively to an area that I was absolutely sure I didn't need. Now, if you're one of those people is still asking in your mind, or you maybe have other people that are asking you, why pray about things that were long ago? I'll tell you, one, many of the times, if you even think of that thing, and should you pray about something from long ago, it's because there's a lie embedded in that that you're believing now, or you're struggling with now, or you're tempted to believe now. So actually, we're not praying about something just because it happened long ago, but there's another reason, too. Even though you might say, well, actually, I'm not believing that lie anymore. It's like this. Satan is a legalist. And what you have done long ago, or believed, or as Jesus said, even thought, that if you have not confessed it as sin and repented of it, it still provides an open door for the enemy to harass you or your descendants today. Now, no, I'm not a legalist, and I didn't say that God is, and yet there are spiritual laws that say whatever you have sown, you will reap. Yes, you've heard that before from me. But what happens is, well, let me give you a natural example. If your mother was a cocaine addict, would you have been born one too? Okay, you can see it in the physical realm, amen? If your mother was severely depressed and crying all the time, do you think that would affect you, even as an unborn child? Yes, it would. If there were fighting and physical abuse in your home and your mother was abused, would that affect you? Yes, it would. We were real people before we were born. And I'm going to share verses with you, but also research and evidence that shows that sometimes we were hurt and wounded even before we were born. Have you ever known anyone that said, I was born angry? <laughs> or they were born angry, probably. Or I was born afraid, or I was born worried, or I was born anxious. They may be absolutely right. Absolutely right. Because 
Evidence shows that we have our faculties before we're born and that we can sense, we can feel, to a degree we have understanding. And while we may not be able to see the outside world, we may not have the ability to walk <laughs> or run from it, while we may not be able to talk, that does not mean that we can't understand. Now you might think this is a little far-fetched, but take a puppy for example. They don't know everything they're going to know as a dog. And maybe they can't talk. But that doesn't mean they don't understand, that they can't learn commands, that they don't know if they're accepted, rejected, loved, or hated. They know, don't they? Well, it's the same with an unborn child whose mind is certainly more sophisticated before they're born than a puppy is. Let me just share a few things with you, and I'm going to assure you at the very beginning that I would never share all this insight with you and not offer to pray with you, so be sure to watch the second video also. We will be praying for you, for your children, and teaching you how to pray more effectively. Now this is not something that you will only need rarely. I was surprised because when I first read these chapters, I was sure that I wouldn't relate to the prenatal part. I came from a fairly stable home, maybe stoic, maybe not very expressive, but stable, consistent. However, was I ever surprised to find out that we all get wounds back to birth and even from conception on. It is absolutely amazing what research has shown. So let me get on with it. First, let me share some verses. In Psalm 32, 2, it says, Our spirits can be deceptive. Would you think that even your spirit can be affected as a little child or an unborn child? It says, Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. You know, some teachings say that your spirit is 100% pure and that there can't be any sin or deceit there, but that's not what this verse is saying. In Psalm 51.10, it says that our spirits can even waver from the truth. Hence, we have the verse, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. You know, our spirit wouldn't need renewing unless something was wrong in the first place. Can our spirit be corrupted so that God would even have to promise us a new spirit? Not if there is nothing wrong with the old one, amen? If it's not broken, don't fix it. But the Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove from your heart your heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you. Now, in the identity seminar that is posted under healing videos on nowfaith.tv, you'll find a lot about this, that we're body, soul, and spirit. Before we were saved or invited Christ into our life, we had an old, unregenerate spirit that was, the Bible says, dead in trespasses and sins, or dead in its ability to communicate with God. However, when we're born again, something is born again. The old has passed away and the new comes. We're a new creature in Christ. The Bible says we're partakers of a new nature. And that we have a spirit that has the ability to commune with God. Hallelujah. But then the Bible is saying here, I will put my spirit, and spirit is capitalized for the Holy Spirit, in you. Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. So what is this about, even in the Old Testament, about a spirit being restored? Psalm 78 says, A generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. So our spirit actually has the ability to be faithful and unfaithful. Our spirit can be treacherous. In Malachi 2, it's talking about not being treacherous in your spirit, not being treacherous to the wife of your youth. If you have never known anyone that's treacherous, this verse may not mean much to you. But I guarantee you, if you have or if you ever do, the word treacherous will take on a new meaning. And the Bible says we can even be treacherous in our spirit. Can you imagine that? In 2 Corinthians 7.1 in the New American Standard, it says, Let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. So it's not just our bodies, not just our flesh, but our spirit can be defiled. Now the question we have today is, can it be defiled when we're very little, before the age of accountability, although that phrase is not in the Bible, by the way. Can 
we be defiled as babies in our spirit? Can we be defiled in our spirit before we're even born? Well, the answer is yes. Even before birth, the wicked go astray, Psalm 58 says. From the womb, they are wayward and speak lies. Now, if I had tried to teach you that you could speak lies from the womb, I'm sure that you would click this off. However, this is Psalm 58, saying that you can believe or think, and it uses the phrase speak lies, even from the womb. Isaiah 48 says, Well do I know how treacherous you are. You are called a rebel from birth. Can you imagine that your home life or your parents' relationship or your own situation can be so negative to you before you're even born that you would want to rebel against God's choices for you? This is undoubtedly one of the most common things that I minister to, and yet people don't know to even anticipate it until I explain it to them. Do you know before you're born that your parents could have wanted the opposite sex or find it in an inconvenient time to have a baby or not want a baby at all? And you can rebel against their rejection of you. You can rebel against the verbal abuse, mental cruelty, physical abuse, against the rejection of not being wanted or not being planned or being considered an inconvenience. I'll go on. Yes, I'll be explaining this. Surely I was sinful at birth takes it to another level. We're talking Psalm 51 here, 5 through 6. I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. <clears throat> now I'm playing with your theology. <laughs> Surely you desire truth in the inmost parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Now what the Bible is talking about here is in your spirit. This inmost place describes our spirit. You know, sometimes we draw ourselves as three concentric circles with the body, soul, and spirit on the inside. And our spirit on the inside being that place that 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, we can be one with His spirit. In Job 33, he says, The Spirit of God has made me the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So this is the good news, that the Spirit of God has breathed life into us. And the body without the Spirit is dead. So faith without deeds is dead in James 2. Now, it's important to know that when we are first conceived, we aren't just a little body. Or just a little body and soul. But it says, the body without the spirit is dead. So faith without deeds is dead. And so the spirit gives life to the body. Now I'm old enough that I remember in the 70s when there was a lot of debate about when is a person really dead. Remember that? And we talked about, is a person really dead when they're not breathing or when their heart stops beating or when they have a flat brain wave? Well, at the same time, I was working in intensive care and coronary intensive care as a nurse. And so I had a strong opinion about this, but never so strong as when I admitted a patient and took care of a patient for a month who was eight months pregnant. During that time, she had absolutely no reactions and responses whatsoever, except like a frog reaction, like if you um, hurt her or stuck her with a pen, which I didn't do. I mean, she would have a reflex reaction. But there was a flat brain wave, yet her heart was beating on its own. She was breathing on her own. Now, by the discussions the media was having, you would think that she was dead. But she obviously wasn't. <laughs> All functions were on go, and this baby was growing and would be delivered naturally. She delivered that baby in a completely unresponsive state with a flat brain wave. Well, yours truly became so curious as to what her ability to understand was. Because being a believer, I had a shallow but some understanding, not as deep as now, that we do have a spirit inside, and I wondered if it was still functioning. So three days after this baby was born, I was watching the heart monitor. I knew her heart beat well. And... As I watched the heart monitor, I said to her, if you don't hurry up and get better, you're never going to see this new baby. And her heart raced. It just raced and raced. I had touched the deepest chord in a woman. The thought of never seeing her child. And her heart raced, beating very rapidly. And I felt so guilty. 
But I knew that somehow she was still in there. And her spirit was trapped in this body that would not function. I think it was that same night, about three days after the baby was born, she did pass away. Her husband had done everything he could to speak life and truth and love to her. It was a hard and difficult time for me too. But I learned something that day. This verse is true. A body without a spirit is dread, dead. But also, as long as a body has a spirit, it's still alive. You've probably been aware of people that were in a comatose state, and when they finally came to, weeks, days, or months later, they could tell you things that were said in their presence, or said to them, or over them. Somehow, even though it looked like their brain was not functioning, their spirit was. And that's who we truly are as a spiritual creature. So how does all this relate? We are given understanding very, very early, and it's difficult to measure but we have understanding. It is the spirit that's in a man, the breath of the Almighty, that gives him understanding, Job 32 says. I should have warned you to get pencil and paper. I hope you do that every time and take down these verses. Like John the Baptist, we have it in the womb, and this is where my stories start to get more interesting. Like John the Baptist was in Elizabeth's womb when Mary went to stay with Elizabeth, and he leaped inside her womb when Jesus, the unborn child, came into the room. He had understanding spirit to spirit. And I don't believe it's just that one very, very supernatural situation. I've carried a child myself, and for those of you that have, you can probably tell more stories than I can. But for those of you that have not, listen and learn. When I was carrying a child, my daughter... I was very aware of her preferences because babies can taste before they're born. They have senses. They can hear. They can see. They can sense the atmosphere in a room. They can sense whether they're wanted or accepted or rejected or an inconvenience. They can sense the feelings of the mother, the anger, the anxiety, the fears, even the ambivalence. It does not have to be a strong emotion. And back then, in that Hebrew culture, they were smarter than we are in some ways. When a mother was not only pregnant, but sure that she was pregnant, she was allowed to resign from chores and the daily duties and spend her time nurturing that unborn child, reading scripture, singing psalms, and encouraging that child, teaching it, if you will. We are just now beginning to start universities to teach people how to teach and train their unborn children. We have evidence that they learn music even, that they recognize music, that they have tastes in music. It's amazing. The Bible says that we have that spirit until we return to the ground, as in Ecclesiastes 12, 7. That this is a spirit we've had all the way from sometime after conception, maybe at conception, until we leave this earth. In biblical times, they were intent on training and teaching and nurturing this child in the first three to five months of pregnancy, depending on their situation, I'm sure. Even the father would be involved in laying hands on, speaking to, exhorting, and comforting the child. Many babies are born with anxiety because their mother was anxious. Many are born with fears and are colicky because the mother was fearful. Some are agitated because of the angry feelings that the mother had or that were in the home. Maybe the anger belonged to someone else, but their mother was afraid of that person with the anger. But what they found out, if there's a consistent emotion that the baby is sensitive to it and may receive it, learn it, or there may be a transference of spirits. If that mother has a spirit of addiction or a spirit of fear, or spirit of anger or rejection, the baby might actually receive a transference of spirits and be born with that spirit. If you haven't taken care of newborn children, maybe you haven't seen this, but I have. Thomas Verney did some research, and while I may not agree with the methods, all the methods he used to research unborn children, his results in the research are useful. He confirmed that unborn babies 
hear, taste, feel, and learn in the womb. Well, why are, why are we concerned with this? Because continually, often, people call me and they said, from the very beginning I felt like I was the wrong sex, or I wasn't wanted, or I have this feeling that I have to prove that I deserve to breathe the air, or I, I don't feel like I have a right to ask for anything, or to be someone. Or maybe they have an anniversary date, and on that anniversary date each year they feel depressed or even suicidal. Well, tune, stay tuned in. Don't leave us yet because I'm going to explain some things that may give you some answers you've wanted it for a long time. Thomas Verney was sharing how experiences in the womb shape a child's personality, their attitudes, and their expectations. Now, I know you probably already believe that in the first six years of life, these definitely shape our belief system and who we are. But it's actually before we're born. The deep, persistent feelings that the mother has are communicated to the child. Basically, the child is trapped inside those feelings and cannot get away from them 24-7. God has had me get down even on my knees in front of people and even speak to the unborn child that, of course, maybe they're in their 30s or 40s now, but speak to that child because God is not a time creature. And speak healing and acceptance and unconditional love and value to that child. And this person will sob and sob and sob because somewhere inside them there is still that feeling that I don't have a right to be here or I'm too early or I'm inconvenienced. If the womb is a friendly place and the child learns, learns that it's okay, that I'm going to, it's going to be okay to be born, it's going to be okay to go ahead and grow and develop, and that the world is a friendly place, but if the mother has ill health, if she's very nervous and irritable or fearful or angry, it may actually develop, I mean, affect the development of the child, studies show. Because unborn babies are even sensitive to the spiritual atmosphere in the room. I can give you testimonies about this. When I was carrying my daughter, when um, we went to Dr. Stanley's church in Atlanta, and, and they would bring in these high-powered sopranos from <laughs> near and far, and they would sing these wonderful solos, and she loved them. I could feel her just jumping up and down inside. She loved those sopranos singing and singing praises to God. On the other hand, sometimes babies that are involved, um, involved yes, in warfare, or their mothers are in serious intercession, groaning and travailing over something, they will react negatively to that atmosphere. It's a little much for them to be involved in warfare, spiritual warfare, I mean, and the groaning of intercession. And they have found that when they leave the room and, and they stop doing that, that the baby calms down. They've seen a very consistent pattern if they continue to go to those meetings and they're involved with the intense emotions of it and the, the loud voices and all that the baby's upset. One more example. I was involved in the passion play that First Baptist of Atlanta would put on every year and it would have like six or seven different showings and it was a really big deal down in the Civic Center in Atlanta. And I would help in the ways that I could with makeup or whatever. And then um, some of my friends were involved and they were either pregnant during all of those practices with loud orchestra playing and loud voices singing. Now to us it was pleasant, of course, but to an unborn child it's very, very loud to have a whole orchestra at your feet. And one of those children um, was not only involved then, but was, the, um, was a baby in the Passion Play. But what they found was it was just too much. It was just too much. And they said for about six months after that, they could not play music of, of any loudness around that baby would start crying. It was just too much. It was overloaded with loud music. So you can be doing the right thing for a good reason, but it still be too much for your child. Even to unborn babies, um, some of these things are difficult for them to understand. So I'm, I'm saying they have understanding, but it doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It might just be too much for them. They found that when mothers are ambivalent, and how many of us weren't, 
I was in a good situation, thank God, and I could be totally positive about um, my child's birth. On the other hand, I had lost the first child, so there might have been a little bit of anxiety because so many mothers do lose their first child. I don't want you to expect it, but it, but it happens, amen. So even ambivalence, you can want the child but dislike being pregnant or feeling sick. You can worry over money and still want the child at the same time. You can want the child but be afraid of delivery. Or you can want the baby and have fears about raising it alone or delivering alone or not having um, someone with you. Maybe your husband is away in the military or um, you're divorced or you have no husband or he's you know, preoccupied in some other way and isn't supportive of you. So there can be many reasons that the child experiences the ambivalence of the mother. And what they have found out is even ambivalence affects the child, that they can grow up to have difficulty making decisions, determining their own feelings and their own preferences, and, and not really tune into life or be slow to engage. Or the baby might actually experience a real hesitance one, about whether to be born or not because the mother isn't quite sure that she wants them. If you're feeling guilty now, I don't want you to. Remember, we're going to pray for you in just a few minutes, so hang in there. Also, I'd like to talk about some evidences that people actually remember wound experiences, womb experiences. Now, this was really hard for me to grasp at first, but research shows that babies not only remember who's who, they know their mother's voice, their father's voice, but they may have already have preferences about whether they will go to their mother when they're born or whether they want their father to hold them, or in some cases they've actually found the baby doesn't want either one to hold them, that they would cry, and they would only calm down if the social worker took them. Babies have preferences and opinions and attitudes before they're born. Some people have dreamed things that represented womb experiences. They've dreamed that they're playing with a rope, that it, how it felt, that it was pleasant to play with it and or even a negative experience with the rope and maybe they were born with the umbilical cord wrapped around their neck. They had <laughs> gotten it into the wrong position. Some babies actually seem to remember, after they're born, seem to remember the Lamaze training. They've seen children rocking and saying, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out because they were there during the Lamaze classes. <laughs> Verney reports infants um, refusing to bond with mothers who rejected them in the womb. So it was actually a two-way thing. Maybe the mother had difficulty bonding with this child, but this child had difficulty bonding with them or learning to nurse. Babies know if there's quarreling and yelling and screaming and one thing that this reminded me of that I learned when I was studying childhood development is that four-year-olds commonly have a phrase that they say, and I tried it, and it happened right away. If you ask a four-year-old, how did you know that? And you express your surprise, you know, how much they know. They have this phrase that it's common to four-year-olds. They'll say, I always knew it. But you know what? According to these studies, that might be true. They might have known it since before they are born. What does all this have to do with anything? <laughs> Babies can develop an anger, for instance, or a rebellion or stubbornness even before they're born. Now, if you had one of these strong-willed children, you'll say, Amen, sister, I had one of those. They can develop that even from being forced to be born before they're ready. Do you know that the, God has put into the baby a way to signal the mother and to signal the delivery process when the baby is ready to be born. It's not just about their physical readiness. And many times, you know, we were encouraged. We didn't know any better. We were encouraged, it's okay, let's induce so we can get our tax deduction or because it will fit our schedule or our needs or our timing. But a baby can be born with quite an attitude and not be willing to be rushed forever after that. If there's fighting in the home that makes the baby afraid, they can be born with colic and nervousness or dependent on the mother, clingy or even undersized. 
You can, however, ask that baby's forgiveness. You say, well, what if they're 30, 40, 50 now? You can ask their forgiveness for rushing them or for providing a scary atmosphere in the home or for being nervous or, or even ambivalent. Also, they notice that babies have preferences before they're born. <coughs> Excuse me. They've noticed that they actually have preferences for composers that they usually prefer, prefer like Vivaldi or Mozart, over rock music. Well, that's not real surprising. But um, Beethoven also was not preferred by most babies because those loud, you know, drum rolls <laughs> and that, that loud thunderous sound was too much for them. Babies learned music sometimes before they were born and they can anticipate what scores come next when they begin to learn to play music as a child. They may be able to hear in their mind what comes next because they heard that music played before they were born. Now as far as what we need to be healed of, I'm sure I've brought up a lot of things already that you might think I need prayer already. But also on a more serious note, if you have found that you get depressed at a certain time each year, even if there's no circumstances or relationship issues to warrant it, it might date back to years ago. And this is very, very real. I mean, some of you know what I'm talking about. You actually feel suicidal. Or you might actually think of a way to commit suicide, and you think, what am I thinking about this for? Why am I thinking about doing it in this particular way? Well, they have found that if the mother was contemplating abortion or even thought of how she might do it, whether she might put an instrument inside herself or use pills or uh, had a plan on her mind that she was considering, the baby is aware of that plan. And I have to my surprise, when I've been prophesying and ministering even to children, God will tell me, this is that. He will bring it to my mind. Of course, you can always minister better to people if you have lots and lots of scripture on board for God to draw from, but also these teachings from the Elijah House School. I have had a teenager before me, and God would say, this is that from prenatal wounds. And... I was ministering to that child how she was chosen, planned, and purpose chosen by God, had a destiny and purpose, even apart from what men might be aware of, or women, or her mother, or parents. And it really ministered to her, but God didn't let me get specific because it was in public. But I couldn't help but try to find her mother afterwards to see how it related. And it was her adoptive mother, and come to find out that her mother her real mother had tried to abort her like three times. And so God was telling her, even though your real mother could not see the plan and purpose for your life and thought that you were out of my time and you weren't, and I have a plan for you. Research tells us that people that um, can even consider abortion can have tremendous guilt and shame and loss and loneliness after the abortion is over. Of course, when you receive that counseling, they didn't tell you, did they, that this would be the results. At the time, when a person chooses abortion, often they have an inability to feel. They've already numbed out. They've already blocked their emotions. Or maybe they're so overwhelmed with fears, with rejection from the father or their own family, or so threatened by abandonment, that they aren't really feeling their normal emotions. Or maybe, in fact, they've hardened their heart and they've been living a self-centered lifestyle and a sinful lifestyle. But you'd be surprised just how many people have had abortions. This is one of the few things I haven't done. <laughs> but they say that 45%, I bet you were going to say, think I would say young people, but 45% of people my age, have had, women my age have had abortions. And many of you men know that you influenced someone, even pressured them, or just left them without your support so that they chose abortion. Some of you parents know that you influenced someone, left them no other choice, or encouraged them to a self-centered lifestyle, or encouraged them not to believe God for a way to take care of this baby because you were thinking of other things besides God's priorities. 
I would like to pray with you today too. To pray with you that you will be able to forgive yourself for harming this child or maybe succeeding in an abortion. I would like to pray with you that influence someone to have an abortion. And, and you can ask God for your forgiveness and maybe ask that person or the other people that were involved. And I would like to pray with you that did not consider or have an abortion, but you feel like many of the circumstances that existed when you were expecting your child may have caused them harm. Or maybe you can see some cause and effect now that they were affected by the circumstances of the home or maybe by your own choices or by the choices of other people around or maybe innocent things like playing, playing loud rock music all the time and you didn't realize the spiritual effect but also the emotional effect that it would have. I would like to pray with you about these things if you would allow me. I'd like to leave you in a, in a prayer that would encourage you again to ask forgiveness five ways, but in a very sensitive way that you would understand how you can pray for the child within. And the next week I'd like to go even more deeply into this in detail. So I want you to be sure to come back next week. But today, if you'd allow me to pray with you now, I would like to say, Father, we just welcome you in sackcloth and ashes if we feel like we've caused great harm. But we welcome you because we know that you're not a time creature and you can overcome anything that was done intentionally or by omission or by ignorance even long ago. And that it doesn't matter what year it was. And that you are here to restore and to give us eternal life, which not only goes all the way forward, but all the way back. And you might be saying, Lord, I didn't know any better. Or maybe you did, that I was ambivalent. I wasn't sure if I wanted this child. I had no idea that it would affect them. Or, Lord, I spoke so many negative things within the hearing of this unborn child. Or maybe your born child or your toddler, and I didn't realize how it affected them. Or, Lord, I spoke negative things like you'll never amount to anything, or you're just mean, or um, I have no hope for you, or why aren't you acting like my child? Why well, want my child to come back? And they felt rejected. There's so many phrases that we can have. There's no end to them, really, of things that we can could have said over our children. But, Lord, I just ask you now for your forgiveness for everything that we have done that caused our children some kind of wounding or rejection. Or if you're that child, you can ask the Lord to help you forgive your parent who caused that wounding or rejection. Maybe they were alcoholic and Lord, today we just release them from all our judgment and condemnation and dishonor for being alcoholic. Or maybe they were away because of divorce or death or work or the military and they weren't there for you and you didn't learn to trust and to bond like you could have. Or maybe they were too busy and they were always at work and you were left with a caretaker or in a nursery where the caretakers changed over and over and you just don't know how to do relationships today like you could have if you'd had a parent at home or were with your parents more often. Lord, we just choose to forgive them for the mistakes that they made, maybe for the chaos in the home, or not being believers, or for the divorces, or for the poverty that they were in because they weren't obeying you, or maybe it was just due to circumstances, just due to life. Lord, in fact, we choose to release you from the blame of the circumstances. In fact, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for judging you, for creating us maybe not with the same intellect as someone else, or maybe we think you shortchanged us on our appearance or on our body, or that we should have been born into a better family, or at least a loving, stable family, or maybe we think you allowed us to be born into a race that is now filled with conflict, or maybe we've held it against you because we were born into a, a low socioeconomic status, 
Whatever it is, Lord, we choose to release you from the blame and choose to accept your choices for us. Even as we forgive our parents for um, the ways that we were wounded or, or we felt rejected or anxious or fearful or scared, we ask you to forgive us for judging them, even before we were born, for judging them as little children. And maybe they were guilty and maybe they didn't do a good job, but Lord, we don't want to be chained to them forever in unforgiveness and bitterness. We don't want to spend our life blaming them. We want to give you access to all the places that need healing and to trust you, to trust you to go back in time to heal us and to heal our children whom we harmed and to bring 100% healing that no one will be wounded and hobbling around forever. In fact, Lord, we choose to believe you that we'll be able to forgive ourselves. Forgive ourselves for believing the rejection and that we're less than or not worthy or not valuable. Forgive ourselves for receiving that message that said I should be aborted or I should be dead or I don't deserve to live. We forgive ourselves for buying into the lies that we're not okay and that we weren't chosen and planned because we had no concept of you, but we choose to receive it now. We choose to receive your truth about us that regardless of the circumstances and the poor choices and the things that our parents did or didn't do, or the, regardless of the choices that we made ourselves and the things that we did or didn't do, that we and our children will be healed and restored, body, soul, and spirit, that you died on the cross, that we can be thoroughly healed, and that we will be able to mature and grow in grace and to receive your unconditional love and acceptance to know that we are totally free of the transference of spirits or the emotions and the negativity that we learned in the past. That we will be an example of your willingness to restore anyone. And we will not be limited by the choices that other people made or even that we made because of your forgiveness and your grace which is unlimited. And so we choose to receive help in body, soul, and spirit. And that new spirit that you're putting in us that can commune with you and can relate to you. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. Now, if you feel like I've opened up a can of worms, I am going to continue next week. So be sure to join with us again. And we're going to be praying about some specific things that children need prayer for. Now, if, whether you have children or not, please tune into this because God will give you opportunities if you allow yourself to be taught and trained as an able minister. God will give you opportunities to minister to children. And obviously, I'm more of an adult teacher, but He has given me serious opportunities to minister to children. And just remember, it's not about us and our ability, but it's about Him, His power, His presence, and His anointing. And be sure to remember to ask someone to join you for NowFaith.tv because we are intent to mobilize and to teach, train, and equip the Great Commission Army for this Great Third Awakening. Amen? We're believing for a revival, but also the restoration of all things everywhere. Hallelujah. Amen.